The Possibilities of Prayer by the Inbounds, Chapter 12, Answered Prayer, Continued. A young man had been called to the foreign field. He had not been in the habit of preaching, but he knew one thing, how to prevail with God. In going one day to a friend, he said, I don't see how God can use me on the field. I have no special talent. His friend said, My brother, God wants men on the field who can pray. There are too many preachers now, and too too few prayers. He went. In his own room, in the early dawn, a voice was heard weeping and pleading for souls. All through the day, the shut door and the hush that prevailed made you feel like walking softly, for a soul was wrestling with God. Yet, to this home, hungry souls would flock, drawn by some irresistible power. All the mystery was unlocked. In the secret chamber, lost souls were pleaded for and claimed. The Holy Ghost knew just where they were and sent them along. J. Hudson Taylor We put it to the front. We unfolded on a banner never to be lowered or folded that God does hear and answer prayer. God has always heard and answered prayer. God will forever hear and answer prayer. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, ever blessed, ever to be adored. Amen. He changes not. As he has always answered prayer, so will he ever continue to do so. To answer prayer is God's universal rule. It is his unchangeable and irrepeatable law to answer prayer. It is his invariable, specific, and inviolate promise to answer prayer. The few denials to prayer in the scriptures are the exceptions to the general rule, suggestive and starting by the fewness, exception, and emphasis. The possibilities of prayer, then, <clears throat> lie in the great truth, illimitable in its broadness, fathomless in its depths, exhaustless in its fullness, that God answers every prayer from every true soul who truly prays. God's word does not say, Come unto me, and you will thereby be trained into the happy art of knowing how to be denied. Ask, and you will learn sweet patience by getting nothing. Far from it. But it is definite, clear, and positive. Quote, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Unquote. We have this case among many in the Old Testament. Quote, Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou mightest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me, unquote. And God readily granted him the things which he had requested. Hannah, distressed in soul because she was childless, and desiring a man-child, repaired to the house of prayer and prayed. And this is the record she makes of the direct answer she received. Quote, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me the petition, which I asked of him, unquote. God's promises and purposes go direct to the fact of giving for the asking. The answer to our prayers is the motive constantly presented in the scriptures to encourage us to pray and to quicken us in this scriptural exercise. Take such, take such strong, clear passages as these. Quote, Call unto me, and I will answer thee. He shall call unto me, and I will answer. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. This is Jesus Christ's law of prayer. He does not say, ask, and something shall be given you. Nor does he say, ask, and you will be trained into piety. But it is that when you ask, the very thing asked for will be given. Jesus does not say, knock, and some door will be opened. The very door at which you are knocking will be open. To make this doubly sure, Jesus Christ duplicates and reiterates the promise of the answer. Quote, For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Unquote. Answer prayer is the spring of love. 
and is the direct encouragement to pray. Quote, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live, unquote. The certainty of the Father's giving is assured by the Father's relation and by the ability and goodness of the Father. Earthly parents, frail, infirm, and limited in goodness and ability, give when the child asks and receives. The parental heart responds most readily to cry for bread. The hunger of the child touches and wins the Father's heart. So God, our Heavenly Father, is as easily and strongly moved by our prayers as the earthly parent. Quote, If ye be evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father in Heaven give good gifts unto them that ask Him? Unquote. Much more. Just as much more does God's goodness, tenderness, and ability exceed that of man's. Just as the asking is specific, so also is the answer specific. The child does not ask for one thing and get another. He does not cry for bread and get a stone. He does not ask for an egg and receive a scorpion. He does not ask for a fish and get a serpent. Christ demands specific asking. asking. He responds to specific praying by specific giving. To give the very thing prayed for and not something else is fundamental to Christ's law of praying. No prayer for the cure of blind eyes did he ever answer by curing deaf ears. The very thing prayed for is the very thing which he gives. The exception to this are confirmatory of this great law of prayer. He who asks for bread gets bread and not a stone. He who asks for a fish, he receives a fish and not a serpent. No crime is so pleading and so powerful as this child's cry for for bread. The cravings of hunger, the appetite felt, and the need realized all create and propel the crying of the child. Our prayers must be as earnest, as needy, and as hungry as the hungry child's cry for bread. Simple, artless, and direct, and specific must our praying according to Christ's law of prayer and his teaching of God's fatherhood. The illustration and enforcement of the law of prayer are found in the specific answers given to prayer. Gethsemane is the only seeming exception. The prayer of Jesus Christ is that awful hour of darkness and hell was conditioned on those words, quote, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me, unquote. But beyond these utterances of our Lord was the soul and life prayer of the willing, suffering, divine victim, quote, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt, unquote. The, answer was, the prayer was answered. The angel came. Strength was imparted, and the meek sufferer in silence drank the bitter cup. Two cases of unanswered prayer are recorded in the scriptures, in addition to the Gethsemane prayer of our Lord. The first was that of David for the life of his baby child, but for good reasons to Almighty God the request was not granted. The second was that of Paul for the removal of the thorn in the flesh, which was denied. But we are constrained to believe this; these must have been notable as exceptions to God's rule, as illustrated in the history of the prophet, priest, apostle, and saint, as recorded in the divine word. There must have been unrevealed reasons why God, which moved God, to veer from his settled and fixed rule to answer prayer by giving the specific thing prayed for. Our Lord did not hold the uh, Syrophoenician woman in the school of unanswered prayer in order to test and mature her faith. Neither did he answer her prayer by healing or saving her husband. She asked for the healing of her daughter, and Christ healed the daughter. She received the very thing for which she asked the Lord Jesus Christ. It was in the school of answered prayer our Lord disciplined and perfected her faith, and it was by giving her a specific answer to her prayer. Her prayer centered on her daughter. She prayed for one thing, the healing of her child. And... The answer of our Lord centered likewise on the daughter. We tread altogether too gingerly upon the great and precious promises of God, and too often we ignore them wholly. The promise is the ground on which faith stands in answering of God. This is the one basis of prayer. We limit God's ability. We measure God's ability and willingness 
to answer by prayer by the standard of men. We limit the Holy One of Israel. How full of benefaction and remedy to suffering mankind are the promises as given us by James in his first epistle, fifth chapter. How personal and meditate do they make God in prayer? How personal and meditate do they make God in prayer? They are a direct challenge to our faith. They are encouraging to large expectations in all the requests we make of God. Prayer affects God in a direct manner and has its aim and end in affecting Him. Prayer takes hold of God and introduces Him to do larger, large things for us, whether personal or relative, temporal or spiritual, earthly or heavenly. The great gap between Bible promises to prayer and the income from praying is almost unspeakably great, so much so that it is a prolific source of infidelity. It breeds unbelief in prayer as a great moral force and begets doubt, really, as to the efficiency of prayer. Christianity needs today, above all things else, men and women, who can, in prayer, put God to the test and who can prove His promises. When this happy day for the world begins, it will be the earth's brightest day and will be heaven's dawning day on earth. These are the sort of men and women needed in this modern day in a church. It is not educated men who are needed for the times. It is not more money that is required. It is not more machinery, more organization, more ecclesiastical laws, but it is men and women who know how to pray who can in prayer lay hold upon God and bring him down to earth and move him to take hold of earth's affairs mightily and put life and power into the church and into all of its machinery. The church and the worldly and the world greatly need saints who can bridge this wide gap between the praying done and the small number of answers received. <coughs> Saints are needed whose prayer is bold enough and sufficiently far-reaching to put God to the test. The cry comes, each now out of heaven, to the people of the present-day church, as it sounded forth in the days of Malachi. Quote, Prove me now, herewith, says the Lord of hosts, unquote. God is waiting to be put to the test by his people in prayer. He delights in being put to the test on his promises. It is his highest pleasure to answer prayer to prove the reliability of his promises. Nothing worthy of God nor of great value to men will be accomplished till this is done. Our gospel belongs to the miraculous. It was projected on the miraculous plane. It cannot be maintained but by the supernatural. Take this new supernatural out of our holy religion and its life and power are gone and it degenerates into a mere mode of morals. The miraculous is divine power. Prayer has in it the same power. Prayer brings this divine power into the ranks of men and puts it to work. Prayer brings into the affairs of earth a supernatural element. Our gospel, when truly presented, is the power of God. Never was the church more in need of those you can and will test Almighty God. Never did the church need more than now those who can rise up everywhere. Memorials of God's supernatural power, memorials of answers to prayer, memorials of promises fulfilled. These would do more to silence the enemy of souls, the full of God and the adversary of the church than any modern scheme or present day plan for the success of the gospel. Such memorials reared by praying people would dumbfound God's foes, strengthen weak saints, and would fill strong saints with triumphant rapture. The most prolific source of infidelity and that which uh, traduces and hinders praying and that which obscures the being and glory of God most effectively, effectively is unanswered prayer. Better not to pray at all and to go through a dead form. 
which secures no answer, brings no glory to God, and supplies no good to man. Nothing so endurance the heart, and nothing so blinds us to the unseen and the eternal as this kind of prayerless praying. 